Hey guys, I am so glad to be back to give you some updates on what's going on. As some of you guys may know, I recently attended the National Heirloom Expo over in Ventura. So whenever these sort of events come up, it does take me quite a long time to prepare for it. That's why I had to take a break on, on YouTube, but I am back uh, with more episodes for you guys. I'm really excited to share. And thank you to those of you who came out, you know, connected with me, supported me. We also did some drawings for giveaways and I did a talk there on small space gardening. So for those of you who didn't make it, no worries. I am going to be sharing the talk with you in this video. And sorry, the mosquitoes like going all over the place here. Thank you to Baker Creek Seeds for having me. I had so much fun. I can't wait to show you guys the vlog coming soon. But for now, I'm gonna show you uh, the presentation that you missed and I'll see you in the next video. So today I'm going to be talking about strategies. Oh, thank you. And how you can maximize growing in a small space or any space really just to maximize uh, food production in different types of arrangements or uh, growing upwards vertically. And I will share a few of my favorite plants or more like rare plants is kind of what I like to focus on because I grow in a small space. So I will share with you about that. Uh, so I'll start off by telling you how big my garden is. I mainly garden out of my patio. It is a roughly 315 square feet. Does anyone have a garden smaller than that? You too, seriously? Well, I guess you get to have more fun than me. But yeah, so hopefully this would help problem solve for some of you. As you can see, it's a pretty simple, straightforward design. It's a very boxed in rectangular garden, six feet wide, 50 feet across, and one of the ends is like, another nine square feet or something. So you're looking straight down from one end and then the other end looking back. And you can see that the pathway is just like about one and a half feet wide. So that really is a challenge for whatever I put in, things get overgrown really easily. But you can see that it is mainly like lots of shade areas, some deep shades also, part sun, uh, a couple of sunny spots and um, but I'm still able to grow quite a lot of varieties. When it comes to growing in small space, it's, I think you have to kind of ask yourself, do you want to grow just a few things and grow a lot of those? Or would you be like me that's obsessed and can't make a decision of what, <laughs> you know? So I end up being able to put like 200 plants in there or something. I haven't actually count lately. That was like the number from like last year. Uh, so, <laughs> but I'm still able to put annuals and perennial plants that are towering over like 13 feet tall in my green tree collard and it's still growing that did collapse and I had to bring it back up after the storm last winter. Um, I got some small fruits and gourds. Gourds are in like really um, trellis, my loofahs and chayote. That's a white spiky chayote. My friend gave it to me once. It was green, but somehow it came out cream color when I grew it. And I kept regrowing it and it's still this color. So it's cool. I have to keep the genetics. So I kept growing it. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I even able to put like a vermicomposting bin in this place. So it's, it's really packed. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Sorry, how do I do this? Oh, that's the one that's worn off. It's the one on the right. Oh, it did. Oh my God, I went. Uh oh, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Right. Now you're not supposed to see this. Oh God. Oh wait. Oh, okay. So here's. <laughs> this is like a nine feet wide, like one of the sides, and that's where I got the loofah. And see that dragon fruit that just flowered recently. So it's nice when you're creating a trellis, especially in a small space, a vine can grow and provide shade for you know growing more plants under, and you get sun. And that's really how I can get uh, you know, uh, plants to capture the sun. This is what my neighbors get to see outside. It looks like I have a lot of sun in the garden, but I actually don't. Luckily, I do have a south-facing garden so uh, anything that grows close to about five feet where the, you know, the top of the wall is where they get full sun. So I do have to start plants in quite a, a good size, at least uh, like a foot tall. Otherwise, they're not really getting sun. It's like putting them in a deep shading forest and the plants just grow really slow. Whenever I grow 
uh, seedlings, I have to kind of start them and put them on the top tier. Do whatever you can to get them big enough so that you can put them next to really tall plants like the green, the green tree collard. And yeah, so that's what it looks like from the outside. This is um, one of the methods I use a lot to pack in the space is that I'm sure some of you guys or many of you guys are familiar with this, the thriller, filler, spiller method that we do arrangements to make it more attractive. But I also follow this kind of a method to pack in. Uh, as an example, I think this is easier to see is that in this container, I got the thriller plant, which is the banana. It's the tallest plant, the most attractive, or just the focal point of the piece. And then the filler, I see it as any space that you want to fill up. Usually it's um, a lower growing plant, the shorter plants, like ground cover type of plants, or plants that would do well in like part sun, part shade, since they are like an understory. Here I got the lettuce growing in the summer so that those broad uh, leaves from the banana is able to provide them some shade. Another thing I also do is grow vines in the back to fill the space. So if you've got like a wall or a fence that you don't like or that you want to maximize your, you know, growing your food production or whatever that is, you can have them growing in the back. And then for the spiller is any plants are kind of like the filler plants. It fills in, but it also cascades, you know, over a wall um, or raised bed, elevated bed, or in this case, this is like 15, no, 18 inches. Uh, it's a very big pot for my space. But that's 18 inches more space that I can grow food. <laughs> Here is one of my favorite um, spreading kind of a crop. I call it the filler and the spiller because this fills up so quickly. It just propagates by cuttings, super easy, within like two weeks you'll start seeing new growth as soon as you pluck those in and have like lightly, like sprinkle some soil over. Every single one of those leaves you're seeing, those are the nodes that would shoot up these like new growth. So it fills up the space really easily and I like that this is, I call it a living mulch. So instead of having dry like wood chips or something, why not grow something that covers up that's also edible? So this is something uh, you might have seen this plant actually, the sedum, in like in the cacti section in the nursery once, once in a while. But it's actually edible, raw or cooked. So I like throwing them in my salad or a little sandwich. And sometimes like my baguettes would look like little like things like you know cascading over. <laughs> and you put edible plant like flowers in and decorate it. And yeah, and it's great that this plant does really well in like full shade, like bright. Uh, bright shade and into full sun. They don't look as pretty in full sun, but they will survive. But this is such a, just a fast growing plant, so I like that about it. And it is a succulent, so it can take, you know, some like, drought. It, it can go without water. I usually do like once a week watering with these, or just when you're watering your other plants and this one is just in there, you don't even have to intentionally like, you know, hose like the entire space. Here is another no-brainer type of filler plant I like to use. This one is, um, Yomaji is a Japanese mugwort. It doesn't smell like the traditional like medicinal herb kind of a mugwort. It's more like a vegetable. It's got really thin, delicate leaves, so I love having them in salads and smoothies. It grows to about just like a couple feet at the most, and it does really well in like a full shade area or just even a couple, uh, couple hours of sun is enough for this to thrive. And um, they spread, but they're not invasive. You can just pull them out very easily if you don't want them. So this is a no-brainer. Like for me, when I don't know what I can put in this space, in a, like in a corner somewhere, this is where this plant goes and it just spreads and I pick them and I eat them. Here's another method. If you're looking to pack the most in your space, in this tiny little space, there's some like a DIY thing. This is like a six inch, uh, over on the left is a six inch PVC pipe. You just drill holes and put plants in. This is one square feet. So this tiny little square, you can put eight plants in. And the great thing about growing vertically and kind of like stacking plants like that is that that distance between each plant would give 
you know, I'll provide a little more light for them versus growing them in like on the plane, on the same plane. Here's another one is a really easy one you can do is just stacking kind of like your traditional like wedding cake style. The, the bottom one being the widest and so that way it would allow you to grow something that likes the sun more to be on the top and then the bottom, uh, yeah, you can put uh, different types of plants to fill uh, full sun or shade, you know, part sun type of plants and it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't shadow over the other plants just because they're in different tiers. Well, one of my favorite uh, growing systems is the green stock. Just because if you're seeing that picture on the left, that is five tiers there and I got six strawberries growing that top tier and then the rest of the four, there are 24 sweet potatoes growing and this is in a four square space. Oh. <laughs> I have not. I have seen people successfully done it. That's why I'm trying it. The only thing I'm really crossing my finger is that I don't get enough sun. That's the problem with me, like my garden. And um, did you plant every pocket with sweet potato? Every what's that? Every, did you plant every pocket with sweet potato? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's 24 pockets for that four tiers. Yeah. Um, but other than that, the other the other a system. I put, you know, like that milkweed to attract pollinators and I got strawberries and like basil, different types of basils and um, herbs and for your salsa. Now, if you're talking about growing on a trellis, there's that classic, you know, lower and lean system. What I like about this system for a small space is that it just makes total sense if you want a plant, like you get to control like this, the plant to just grow in you know, as much space as you want and it wouldn't go over that. So in like a commercial farming, they use this method a lot because they mainly they're growing like tomatoes or, or uh, cucumbers and you, the idea is that you allow just the, the main stem to grow to the top and any side growth, you would prune it off. And so the plant just keeps growing directly just like, you know, one direction. So you really can control that space that way. And when they get to the top, you lower the string and you move it over a little. And then you just keep leaning it over and it kind of goes on like a conveyor belt. It's like uh, those old black and white movies when people are the character like walking, you know, like in the same space. And this is kind of what it's doing. But I've utilized this type of trellis this year to grow yam, the purple ube, if anyone familiar with that. It's um yeah, it's a purple yam. And the yam is a true vine. It really climbs and just grabs onto things. So I'm using each string is for one plant and it just goes up the string and it goes back down that same string up and down. So that's like the total space saver that I'm able to grow. I think eight plants here in a five by 18 inches. So now let's um, talk about some of my favorite plants for the small space. This is a cactus. It's a leafy climbing cactus called Barbado gooseberry. The leaves are edible and they fruit and they have really pretty fragrant flowers. And the flowers actually, they bloom around fall when a lot of other plants have been exhausted. And that's, so that's what I really enjoy about this one and they really attract like the most amount of bees I've ever seen on a plant. And I trellis it up so that it doesn't fall over because they do have thorns. But I like that when plants are able to provide, like, you know, do multiple things when they're not flowering, they're not fruiting, the leaves are edible. So it's not like something I can grow and enjoy for like a season kind of thing. And this, uh, this grows well in part sun or even full sun. So it gives me more options in like my garden. Here's the fruits. They look like cherry tomatoes with a little bit of spikes, kind of like the yellow dragon fruit. And people make jam with it. And they're, they're really abundant. This is one of my favorite favorite leafy greens to grow of all time. It's not one that we would normally eat like the leaves, not 
directly, but we would harvest the leaves to make jello out of it. This is a very vigorous vine. Even if you're, you know, if the soil dries out completely for a few days, it's still fine. Like it's really hard to kill it. <laughs> so that's actually really great for me because whenever they grow like crazy, that means it's another feast for me. And um, yeah, they grow well in containers too. They don't seem to really stress out even putting them in like a five gallon and set a tomato cage on it. And this thing is uh, like a true vine again, similar to that yam I showed you earlier. It'll just wrap itself up and down the same pole and it's perfectly happy and you can just pick those leaves from there. And you're curious, this is what it looks like. And I just had that for lunch like yesterday. Snack. Um, literally, it's just water and leaves. You blend it and you strain it and you get this. And I actually have a more like in-depth video on YouTube on how to do that if you're curious. But I do want to show you guys how it looks. We have a video of that. Thanks. So here's a little short clip. Yeah. It's very mild. It's almost, no, just a little bit like a grass kind of a scent, grassy. You know, I haven't tried that, but it seems this plant is really unique. It doesn't like, it likes to bind to itself. I've tried juicing, you know, like to flavor it that way so it would be like really like jello. Um, it doesn't, it just binds to itself. So what I like to do with it is I, I would, eat it by itself or I chop them up like cut them in cubes and mix do like a mixed fruit bowl with it yeah and put like coconut cream or something on it yeah so this is one of my favorite leafy greens to grow and it's a great filler plant it grows crazy so it covers up the walls and provides shade on certain trellis now I assume that if you got some sun loving plants, you might as well utilize that space and grow some shade loving plants. This is Ashitaba, it's a Japanese herb. It is um, a medicinal herb and I enjoy juicing with this one a lot because uh, eventually when it gets big, it just kind of grows like a, a celery stalk. I mean, the way how a celery grows and uh, one stalk can be as thick as um, that, it's, wow. it's pretty long and so like one is enough for like putting it in a smoothie or something. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is really great as like a shade loving plant or even in part sun, just keep them away from after, uh, afternoon, that really intense sun. But other than that, this loves my garden. A lot of Japanese greens do well in a shady garden, that's what I noticed. It, they just, um, they, they really, really like truly thrive in my garden. They get really huge, um, which is difficult sometimes you find plants. Uh, yeah, can we? In what way is it medicinal? Uh, there's a lot of research about anti-cancer, um, very specific ones, but yeah, you can look it up. And then they have the vitamin B12 that most plants do, uh, don't have. And it has this like yellow resin that they call like, you know, bleeds when you cut the stem. And it doesn't come off your clothes if you get them on there. Oh, okay. yeah. Once I got dripped on my hat. Okay, so the leaves are edible too. I use it as a spice. I would cut it thinly and like garnish, or I add that to the smoothie as well. Yeah. And I am going to, I guess, end this with something kind of sweet and spicy. This is one of my favorite peppers that I grow, it's called chili flora. It actually has a very, it's so similar to, I think Baker Creek had these seeds at one point called Nepalese bell peppers. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah, so these peppers, they, they have like a sweet taste, but they have um, like mild to medium spicy. Each fruit has kind of like a different level of spiciness, but it doesn't get too hot. 
But the great thing I noticed about this one is that it actually stresses out a little bit in the sun. It'll fruit a lot, but the leaves doesn't look as nice, not as green um, as growing it in part shade. And this plant is growing next to my fuchsia and hydrangeas, which are more shade loving plants, but they still fruit. Like they're really abundance just it's an awesome plant. And then as the season gets cooler and in the winter, that's when I notice that there's so much new growth and they start budding in like spring. So it's one of the earliest budding, you know, peppers. So I really enjoy growing this one as well. So and this one is, um, yeah, one of my favorites and they do really well in, and, and they're about four to five feet tall. So yeah, I guess that's pretty much my small garden. But it, hopefully this inspires you guys to grow no matter you know, how big your space is. It's always good to start now and then the next day. Um, personally for me is I, I started you know, growing when I got really obsessed with my, my dog's health and like my family. And then uh, one day when, you know, when there was nothing else that they could do for her, my, the vet actually believed, truly believed that those are juices that I gave her that gave her like another six months with a quality of life. And if I didn't do that from the beginning, I would have been able to start growing at that time. So I think being proactive is definitely um, important. So yeah, let's uh, move on to Q&A. <laughs> yes, what's your? Uh, yeah, they can transplant well. You can start from seed or transplants. So can you buy them in a nursery? Yeah, it's kind of rare. I have s one time I got a, a nursery many years ago, but uh, I have seen it, but it's it's not common. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'm in LA, so anything I grow, I think um, you guys would have a good chance growing. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering if you have any that's a good question. Yeah, uh, spider mites sometimes, uh, especially with the tomatoes later on. But I think that's one of the common ones. And um, yeah, spider mites is one of the biggest things. I don't think I notice much aphids, uh, and just your, you know, the the normal the caterpillars and yeah, the moths. Those those are the two biggest ones I get. And I usually just hose them down if I can. If it really attacks badly, it's uh, a little bit of neem oil and water. But that's about it. Or sometimes you just have to let go of the plant or, or cut it back and hopefully it'll grow back. Um, I think she had a, her hand up for a while. Yeah. I have a question about oh. your trellis. Yes. We had a, I was going to ask you, what did you use? It was a Bermuda trellis it didn't look like PVC, it almost looked like... Mm, yeah, that's, that really story that, yeah, the line, the string trellis. The metal, but the metal Yes, box, it's, it? so it's a EMT, I think it's called, conduit. It's an electrical section at, you know, like a local hardware store. And you just cut them. They're super easy to make, by the way. One of the sturdiest, like long-lasting trellis. Uh, yeah, they sell these little tools and you cut it, and there are connectors that you can buy. One of them called, uh, uh, maker pipe. Ever since they started making that, it's just literally screwing on these uh, connections, so it's very easy to build. Do you have a YouTube for that? I, I think so. Yeah, one of the recent, more recent videos. Can you talk a little bit about? Because I didn't think so. I grow a lot of sweet. I'm in Seattle, now, so. Oh wow. Really okay. But I grow a lot of sweet potatoes, right? Yeah. I didn't think yams would grow here in the states. So did you talk about an ube? I did. Yams? So you grow an ube in the uh -huh. states. Yeah. I do grow, uh, grow ube. <laughs> okay. And it really is a ube. It yeah. is, because a lot of people think like the purple sweet potato and they just label as ube. Um, but the true yam is very slimy. It's like a very heavy starch um, crop and it's one of the survival type of foods. One of the ones that would live through, you know, like monsoon season in Asia. When they said that's like a woodier skin. And yep, was exactly. Yeah, a lot of water. It's like it's so slimy when you grate it. It's like goo. 
But does it taste good? It's actually kind of a little bit sweet, but more almost tasteless, but a little sweet. It's it doesn't really have much flavor. I think they add like a vanilla extract or something to those um, desserts because it actually is just a really really beautiful like high calorie food. Uh, doesn't really have a scent. So sweet potatoes are better. I mean, taste, taste wise. Taste wise, yeah. I think yeah, it's sweeter. It's it, different things you can do with it, but definitely has flavor. Sweet potatoes, yeah. Hi, yes. Um, that one, if you're doing like a line, the irrigation, just go from the top, just by gravity, goes down. But I do because I didn't start irrigation after I built it. But you can. That's actually a smart idea: is to run the line under, and um, yeah, so that you can actually get a more, uh, yeah, a better watering for. But it, it works. Yeah. Yes, what's your? Um, how old is your garden? When did you start? Uh, four years. Plants grow pretty fast. <laughs> Some plants do. Uh, yeah, general in the green. Are you going mostly in native soil or the ag soil? Yeah, um, the lower portion is native. I didn't cover, you know, uh, and it's a very like, heavy clay soil, but the top, uh, it's definitely all good soil. It's potting mix, it's um, uh, compost. And sometimes I even like to start just by throwing in food scraps or anything. If I start something new, just dump whatever that's compostable in and then, uh, yeah, put some potting mix uh, on top. And eventually they, they really compost down, you add more. Oh, yeah, hi. Are there plants that you overwinter and keep in the pods? Do you cover them with? To yeah. I do a few that are more like tropical or, or cold sensitive kind of plants. Uh, but the key thing I notice with plants that are more sensitive to cold, and especially in like Southern California, I think you can get away with a lot of them just by, um, you know not watering as much. It's really that cold and that wet, like really damp soil that kills a lot of the plants. So some plants were really hurt by our, our previous um, winter storm. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, yes. Did you say, uh, what kind of soil would you use for the tower that you showed? Uh, yeah, so the two soil that I mainly use is um, the Fox Farm potting soil. You find that at um, hydroponic stores usually. Uh, or some like smaller nurseries. And the second soil I use is from uh, SD Micros, which is uh, based in San Diego County. Uh, actually, yeah, San Diego County, oh, SD Micros. I actually have some samples of that soil. I have a, a booth over the vendor hall. And I'll, oh, by the way, I'm doing a giveaway of that green stock. If anyone's interested, make sure you go sign up because I'm going to be uh, drawing out the winner pretty soon and the winner gets to just take that basically that sample piece home and some other giveaways so we don't I don't want to go home with this stuff you guys I, I want you guys to start growing and me having a lighter load Where's yeah. your booth? Um, over indoor uh, vendor hall and by the door oh crap I'm so bad at where the Baker's Creek booth is thank you thank you <laughs> Yeah. What's your favorite yes. fertilizer? Oh, my favorite fertilizer. I use a lot of um, the liquid fertilizers, also by Fox Farm. And um, oh, what else? Um, I rely a lot on uh, with worm castings. It's just so forgiving. It's something that's so mild, but also so good, you know, for the, the soil. I also do compost teas. I brew tea. Um, and I know some people say like leachate isn't good or, or you know the liquid that comes out of a tumbler isn't good but I also use that in diluted water to plants. My galanga which is um, a Thai ginger is going up like um, six and a half or seven feet tall just from yeah water and that water that that runoff I guess from the tumbler. <laughs> yeah. I have three questions. Okay. okay. Um, one is, do you grow anything tropical that um, 
a lot of us wouldn't think we could grow in Southern California? Um, we grow a lot of well, yeah, a lot of gingers we can actually grow. Uh, when I started out, people were surprised that I'm able to grow bananas. Yeah, there's different varieties too. Do you sell seeds from what you grow or do you recommend out? Uh, I do have plants and seeds, very selective you know, items on my website. And, um, yeah, so that's information, uh, yeah, wendyland.com, and I'm on social media. But yeah, I have selective types of, like, you know, seed selection and all that. And um, let's see if there's another one with a question. Yeah, and I'll get back to you on the third one. Okay. Hi, yes. So how many plants In my space? Well, the last time I counted was last year, and it was like something like 200. <laughs> but it, uh, and of all those plants, what would you say are so if it's a shade loving it's going to be that yomaji is a good one because it just it grows pretty fast it um, it's not too picky you know how much light it gets it spreads and um, yeah and delicate leaves it's beautiful ground cover uh, that's one of them and uh, if you're looking for like a sunny plant, like in my garden, the tree collar grows really well. And that one is so abundant, I end up just, that's like the majority, the base of my juice usually. <laughs> tree collards. And there's a purple and green variety. Uh, yes, so uh, lady in green. <laughs> yeah, those are, yeah. Those are very easy to grow. Her question was, can you grow Malabar spinach? Yeah, uh, there is a green and a red variety. Yeah, and they're really beautiful, like climbing vegetables. In fact, in a small space, if you want to grow like leafy greens that like climb like a vine, you can also just grow a bunch of them in a small space and just keep cutting it back to eat. So they don't even have to climb. That's how they do a lot in like farms in, in Vietnam. They just have like plots of land with like so many in, you know, just in this one like small space, and then you just keep cutting it back. You don't even have to worry about letting them climb. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the one in the back. Yeah. I use grow bags. I, I have all kinds, but grow bags I do use, and I just have to be careful um, with it drying out very quickly. So mulching is important, and having like a good potting soil that retains moisture. Do we go back to your third question? Um, so on the yam plant that you had finding, yeah. Does, do you just eat the leaves because it doesn't grow yams, or does it grow yams? Oh, so the, the yam actually is not like sweet potatoes. The leaves are not, it's poisonous. Yeah. You only eat, yeah, and you can't eat the tuber raw either. It's like a cooked food. Yeah, and you eat the tuber. And that one that you have? The, the, yeah, on the string, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the yam, that's a true yam. And that's the one? that you can only eat the tuber. Yeah, it's fun, it's so confusing. Like the market would label sweet potato and yam, but they always price the yam a little more. I don't know. And most of them here in the States are really just sweet, sweet potatoes. potatoes. Yeah, yeah, like our Thanksgiving. Looking, but people, they just call them yams. Yeah, I don't know, is it like a marketing? Yeah. yeah. It's like the, the bell peppers. It's all the same, it's in different stages, but they. That's why the green's always cheaper. <laughs> That's time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much, you guys. Yeah. Wendy, thank you so much. Thank you.